Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hi, folks. Welcome. Thank you for joining. Everyone. Hello, everybody. A few seconds. Yeah, good evening. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Give it a few seconds to let everyone come in. Welcome for those of you just joining us. Thanks so much for joining. We've still got people coming in. We'll just give it a few more seconds. Hi, folks. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. OK, I think we've got most people now, so we'll make a start. Well, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the online Nature Trek Roadshow. I'm Sarah Frost, Nature Trek's marketing manager and a cruise leader, and I've worked for Nature Trek for six years now, and I'll be your host for this evening, speaking to you from Hampshire. Now, as many of you know, we'd normally be out on the road at this time of year, delivering our talks in person in different venues across the UK, but it is such a pleasure to be able to bring them online to you and to provide some lighthearted entertainment and escapism during these cold winter evenings. We're continuing to receive messages uh, into the office from people highlighting the almost therapeutic value of these evenings. And it's extremely heartwarming to feel that we have now forged almost a Nature Trek community online by doing these presentations. And we can't wait to get you all traveling again. And don't underestimate what our speakers and our staff are getting out of this too. Each and every one of us have greatly missed talking about the wildlife and the destinations that we're passionate about. And speaking to the many of you on the phone who are calling into the office to inquire about holidays the day after these presentation evenings has given us just such a huge boost as we get on, to, you booked onto holidays later this year or next year, which we very much hope to run. So thank you very much for that. We have 366 households joining us this evening, so we could guesstimate around five or 600 people and a very warm welcome to all of you. Many of you will have seen we've extended our series of evening presentations through to March, uh, all of which can be booked online. And if there are any topics that you'd like to see us run, which we haven't covered already, then please do just let us know. They can shape our plans for future presentation ideas if we run these again later in the year. Now, if this is your first time at one of our webinars, please do ask any questions using the Q&A section on your screen. We'll type replies throughout the evening, but we'll also read out questions at the end at 9.05 after the last presentation. Please feel very welcome to use the chat section, which is at the bottom of your screen if you're on a PC or at the top of your screen if you're on a Mac. Feel welcome to include all attendees when you're messaging. It creates a nice chatty atmosphere but the messages can be a tad distracting for those on smaller screens, such as iPads. So if you're sending messages to all attendees, that's fine. And um, if you could try and limit it for when the speakers aren't presenting. Uh, so during the interval is fine or during the Q&A section at the end, that would be appreciated. But please do do it. It's a nice opportunity for you to chat to your fellow nature trekkers. And just on the Q&A section, um, uh, just a reminder that if you do have a question, please type it in there in the Q&A section, not in the chat, just in case we miss it there, which we don't want to do. Now, if you're on our mailing list, you should have received our 2021 and 2022 brochure, which is out now. If you're not on our mailing list and you'd like to receive a copy, then please just email us at info at naturetrek.co.uk and we'll pop one in the post to you. Likewise, our website is a huge resource of information and it has further details of all of our tours, including detailed itineraries and is teeming with tour reports of previous holidays. So please do go online and have an explore. Finally, for any people new to Zoom, don't worry, we can't see or hear you. It's just the panelists that are in the spotlight. <laughs> so the Caribbean is known for its diverse cultures, its rich music, vibrant cuisine, and of course, many people immediately think about its stunning white sandy beaches. But these islands are also blessed with superb wildlife. Over a quarter of the bird species on the islands are endemic and sitting between the cooler climes of North and South America, the Caribbean islands attract birds from both continents too, making it for a very exciting bird watching experience indeed. And to tell us more this evening, we're joined by the familiar faces of Tom Mabbitt and Andy Tucker from the Nature Trek Thanks. office. Also Byron Palacios, one of our tour leaders, but joining us for the first time tonight is Ed Druitt, one of our long-standing tour leaders, who's going to start the evening by taking us to St. Lucia and Trinidad and Tobago. 
Thanks for joining us, Ed, and I'll hand over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Sarah. Well, good evening, everybody. There we are. I'll bring up my presentation and just get this started. Beautiful. Right. Well, I hope everybody's really well. It's lovely to be joining you all this evening. Uh, usually I would just be getting back from uh, St Lucia in usual times and what have you. So it's great to be able to share with you uh, some of the joys actually in the wildlife that I've seen over that time. Just a little bit about myself. I've been with Nature Trek now since 2008 and actually my first tour I did for Nature Trek was with Byron uh, in Spain looking for wolves and bustards and since then I've been to the both polar areas, the Antarctic here with Gentoo penguins, the Arctic, and lots of places in between from the Solomon Islands to Monterey Bay. But this evening, I want to take you just over 4,000 miles over towards the Caribbean, over the Azores, and heading down here to the Lesser Antillean Islands. And St. Lucia itself is right bang in the middle over here, if you can see there with my cursor. And if we scale down towards Venezuela, we've got Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm going to start off, we call these islands the Lesser Antillean Islands, and the further away you get from Venezuela, the, the, less, the lower the diversity of birds you get, but uh, the greater you, number of endemic birds you actually get there. And actually most of these outer islands here have their own, very own endemic parrot, for example. And with St Lucia, we land down in the bottom of the island down here. Um, if you go all the way up towards the top, it's about 30 miles uh, lot wide or what have you and but all of this middle bit here is covered in big mountains so we start off down here in the south and we usually arrive at about quarter past about three quarter past three in the afternoon and this gives us the chance before it gets dark sort of quarter to six six o'clock to actually see quite a lot of St Lucia as we head all the way up this west coast to Anne Chastenay which is over here where we actually um, stay and this is a nice sheltered side of St Lucia the Atlantic site tends to be a lot rougher, but we're over on the much calmer um, Caribbean seaside. And most of this kind of central part of St Lucia is forest, um, some of it secondary, a little bit of primary. And we spend a couple of days actually heading up there to look for some of the wildlife that's there. And this is the sort of view that you'll get from the very south. This is very close to the airport looking north. Uh, you can see all the mountains there. There's about 24 different volcanic vents. And on your left hand side, you're looking at the pitons. These are two volcanic plugs very close to where we actually stay, which are like the icons really of St Lucia itself. And as we get very close to Anne Chastenay, you'll be very much following the pitons all along the way. This is Soufrier, the town very close to where we stay. And uh, also within this kind of 12 kilometer square zone of, of volcanic activity and sulfur springs, which is like an open caldera. Literally this mud here is only a couple of kilometers above from hot magma. So you get lots of steaming mud. And in the places where it's cooler, you can actually go for mud baths and have the mud put on your skin for, for better complexity and, uh, com and what have you. And when we get to Anne Chastenay, which is our, our sort, of, sort of rustic boutique hotel, it's just the most wonderful paradise place. At this time of the year, we, we go in January, sort of first, second week of January, when the dry season is just starting to kick in. And if we do get rain, it generally tends to rain at night or we have very brief showers throughout the day. And the rooms are spread throughout the hillside in a way that when you're looking out of your balcony towards the sea or the pitons, you wouldn't realise that you had neighbours or other people very close by. And this tour for you has been designed both for those of you who would like to obviously experience uh, an island like St Lucia, but also if one of you is, is, is perhaps a slightly less interested in wildlife, then it's a designed in a way that the afternoons are available for you to enjoy the beach, the sunshine, and just exploring uh, this part of St Lucia for yourself. And this is actually the beach restaurant down here where we uh, alternate eating between there and a, a restaurant higher up. So it's a beautiful kind of wooden rooms reflecting the colours and the theme of St Lucia. Lots of beautiful St Lucian artwork in all the different rooms, unique artwork and flowers to reflect the country and the colour. And as I mentioned, there's lots of different restaurants here as well. We tend to alternate as a group between them. Down here at the beach, you've got the uh, grill bar. You've got a spa, which is a sort of East Indian Caribbean infusion food. And you can always mix and match menus so if you're not so keen on that sort of food you can always have the menu from from the main bar and the treehouse restaurant for example has a la carte 
uh, which we'll go to several times during the time that we're there. It's a nine day tour. So we've got the chance to eat in various places and try different foods. And on one of the mornings, actually, we go to Emeralds, the gardens of the hotel to see where a whole variety of familiar plants that we might get in the supermarket and we actually see them growing for real and we also meet the chefs and they cook us some fabulous food lo using local vegetables and fruit and here we've got chef Elijah and chef Salvatore actually cooking up some food for our group uh, and then serving it up and one thing I must emphasize is the hotel does fabulous creative dishes for vegans for vegetarians and for all sorts of other um uh, eating requirements so so you you, you won't feel uh, left out you'll feel actually you're having some fantastic creative food and when we do go to eat you've got beautiful night skies with the planets above us even mercury on the beach you might sometimes spot the white crown night herons looking for crabs for example the next morning, your wait to the pitons in the backdrop, uh, the chattering sounds of grey kingbirds like this one here, chattering away along with Zenaida doves. And also down by the beach, you've got one of the best, um, the best reefs in St Lucia, sheltered on this kind of west coast. You've got beautiful clear waters, the most magnificent untouched uh, corals to see lots of different fishes like this uh, file fish and some of them quite tame, they get used to seeing people and also turtles like this green turtle here which often feed on the eelgrass. And on two of the mornings we head out to look for dolphins and sometimes whales as well and here we've got some just in front of the pitons. We go out usually on a catamaran but sometimes a smaller boat depending on the group size and here we've got Fraser's dolphins for example actually in front of Anne Chastanay Beach itself. Generally, we're looking for pan tropical spotted dolphins. You can see the spots just on the surface of the animal here. And a little bit of footage from January last year. Just showing you how clear the water is and just how close these animals are and very calmly coming to the boats. While we're out doing the dolphin watching, there's also the chance to see some seabirds like these brown boobies, which look like they're kind of on their own kind of icing on top of the rocks here. And these guys specialize on flying fish. So when they are actually diving around you, unlike a gannet, which tends to dive straight down into the water, these tend to just go under the surface looking for those flying fish. And while we're out there, there is always the chance of pilot whales and also sperm whales. Here we've got a sperm whale that we saw a couple of years ago now in front of the pitons. These dive up to three kilometres down underwater and then come up for a good half an hour or so to replenish the oxygen in their muscles. And this one's just doing some blowing off to the left there and then going back down again. And last year we were very lucky, we had such calm waters. We even had three or four dwarf sperm whales. These are very difficult to see, very shy animals. And uh, we just uh, saw them in time before they just slipped underneath the surface of the water. And while we're on their trips, uh, we also just slip into Soufrier to a sea cave where there's thousands of these Antillean fruit bats. You're looking just into this slit, as you can see here, and uh, watching them kind of flying around and calling in front of you. There's quite a number of different people we meet uh, from across St Lucia as well. This is Vision. Some of you may have met him at the bird fair and here he's explaining about some of the birds that we're going to see with him at Descartes and in some of the dry habitat on the east of the island. In the middle here in the stripy top you've got Pamela. Uh, she's represented St Lucia in the Olympics uh, in, 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 in athletics and she's showing us some of the wildlife here at Millet. And here's Menno, he's the Anne Chastanay's guide. And he's brilliant at telling us about some of the stories to do with the plants that his grandmother told him. And so he takes us on a wonderful tour on the first day, seeing the plants and the wildlife and telling these different stories. And here's vision at one of the wetlands. The wetlands are quite unusual habitats on St Lucia. And this one close to the south of the island is a great place for spotting ducks and coots, uh, egrets and herons like this juvenile little blue heron green herons as well, and also sometimes ospreys. But on many of the days, we actually focus our time in the rainforests. Um, some of this is tropical, sorry, some of this is secondary rainforest, some of it's primary as well. And we're basically looking at the lush vegetation and some of those kind of openings where you've maybe had some natural landslides that opens up the forest habitat. And here, for example, at Descartier, we're looking out for some time across the viewpoint where you get the chance to spot things like 
broadwing hawks, which uh, squeak away as they're circling overhead. And you'll get the chance to hopefully see and hear St Lucia's emblematic bird, really, the uh, St Lucia parrot, of which there's over 2,000 pairs now. And uh, you'll often hear them squawking before you see them. And here we've got one which is just doing a little bit of circling around. Very difficult to see in the trees, but as soon as they fly across in pairs or small groups, um, they become reasonably easy to spot overhead. In this in forest environment, we're also spotting things like land crabs and purple throated carib hummingbirds. These are always very territorial and chasing each other. If you get them in the right light, you can see this beautiful crimson pink throat. There's small Antillian euphonias, these goldfinch sized birds sound like little twittering goldfinches feeding on mistletoe. And also up here, we might well see or hear the rufous throated solitaire. This little song thrush sized bird has a beautiful whistly song like this. A really nice sound of the solitaire there. And in this forest environment, we're also looking for things like Lesser Antillian flycatcher, the St. Lucia black finch, one of the endemics. So you've got about a dozen or so birds that are only found in those Lesser Antillian islands. And then you've got some birds like the black finch, which is found just on St. Lucia. There's also the St. Lucia warbler, this beautiful bright yellow bird with a very distinctive song. which is very easy to see often outside your room. And the St. Lucia Oriole. And the great thing is, is that the rainforest is part of an ecological network all the way down to Anne Chastenay. So actually in the trees and plantations close to the hotel, we've also got the chance of seeing some of these endemics, like for example, the St. Lucia Oriole. We also go up into an aerial tram above the emergent forest vegetation, looking at the tree ferns, getting a real sense of the forest structure and how it works. And here we might have birds such as the St. Lucia peewee, a type of flycatcher, the grating sound of the mangrove cuckoo, and the grey trembler, a bird that has this long down curved beak for probim. It sounds a little bit like a blackbird singing. And this down will curve beak is ideal for probing in dead wood and have these little shivery wings as well when you see them come into your balcony outside your room. We also look out for the white breasted thrasher, a critically threatened bird only found in Martinique and St Lucia and a bird that we tend to see in the dry habitat on the east coast. And of course there's hummingbirds like green throated caribs, Antillian crested hummingbirds which are very tiny and come to these little flowers very close to the restaurants. You'll get the chance to see things like scaly naped pigeons and the grey kingbirds that I mentioned earlier, as well as carib grackles and beautiful butterflies. If the flowers are flowering in the way they normally do, we've got Caribbean buckeyes and long-tailed skippers, gold fritillaries and reptiles like anole lizards, uh, St Lucia boas we see occasionally. This was a young animal we saw last year, just molting. And also when we've got fruiting trees around Anchester today, we may see things like spectacled thrush and scaly breasted thrashers, which become very approachable actually when they're feeding on these fruits. Also finch-like birds, such as the Lesser Antillian Saltator. And these birds will be very common around your room. This is the Lesser Antillian Bullfinch. This one's just coming to some banana. And before we head on to Trinidad, one of my favorite, favorite sounds of St. Lucia, it's a sound that if I'm watching the Caribbean on television, on dramas, I'll be listening out for this animal. It's the, it's a penny size, only the size of a one penny piece, Lesser Antillian whistling frogs. And this is the sound that we hear when we are eating and going to bed in the evening. So a beautiful sound of St. Lucia there. So I hope that's whetted your appetite to a wonderful place at this time of the year. It's 24, 25 degrees Celsius. It's a beautiful, beautiful heat and just a wonderful chance to warm up and see some lovely, rich wildlife really in this, uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful country. So as we leave the pitons behind, we then travel literally just about an hour actually south of St. Lucia into Trinidad. And these are some of the marshes and mangroves actually in the uh, island on the uh, west side of the island as we're coming into the airport. 
And this is Trinidad here. We tend to come into the airport around here and then spend lots of time exploring the forest in the north and also some of the habitats, the wet and habitats on the west coast, the east coast and some of the drier savannah in the centre as well. We also get a little plane over to Tobago and spend time in the northeast of the island. And we'll come back to that in a, in a short moment. So this is the Acer Wright Centre where we are based. It's a beautiful place with, uh, again, sort of boutique rustic kind of rooms. And below us, we've got this wonderful planted area with lots of food for the animals to, to come to and food that's put out for them as well. And it's a great chance to photograph lots of wonderful wildlife. And in the mornings, dawn chorus, the cocoa thrush, dominating the dawn chorus. And later in the day, the chance to spot mop mots, parrots, uh, bellbirds, and all sorts of birds like that. And once the fruit's out, we've got the chance to look for wonderful, wonderful birds. These crow-sized orimpendolas, for example, coming down to the watermelon. This superb, beautiful palm tanager with all those soft greens and buff colors along its plumage. And of course, the chance to see birds such as the white-necked Jacob Jacobin, hummingbirds up close. Here's an adult, here's a juvenile, and another perched adult just there. This is a violaceous euphonia coming down from the canopies. Again, these birds feed on the mistletoe, but will come down to fruit as well. A white-chested emerald hummingbird. And look at this stunning copper-rumped emerald hummingbird just in front of me here. So you've got the chance to get up close. This is one of my favourite photographs here. This is the purple honey creeper with these little gems just under its eye and those beautiful yellow legs. A bird that's very well adapted to feeding on long tubular flowers, um, but likes to come to the nectar as well. And this green hermit hummingbird was actually nesting in the Acerite centre itself. And uh, we got to see her feeding her babies. So it's a really great chance to come together and just see such a diverse variety of wildlife. You'll all see mammals like the agoutis. And when we do go walking around Acer Wright, it's a chance to see, for example, the white bearded mannequin, which forms a lek. And you have all these males jumping around, calling and singing, while there's females on the outskirts choosing the best male. And if you listen, you'll also hear this bird. It's the bearded Bilbo, bellbird, and this is the bird that was making that sound. This is the recording I took from him. This beautiful cocoa coloured head, these dangly bits coming down from its beak there. Often we'll see them out in the open through the scope, but on this occasion actually we have the wonderful bird under the canopy. So a really lovely chance there for you to see these very distinctive tropical birds. And while we're walking around there's also the chance to see a whole variety of other fauna as well. These tent making bats, one of my favourite ones to have found uh, when I was last out there. Big reptiles like these tago lizards, very cryptic spiny tailed tree lizards and snakes such as this grass machete and this boa constrictor. This one was out on a lawn just as I came out of my room. I got some quick snaps, went off to get people. Unfortunately by the time I came back it had gone but it was just beautiful, beautifully coloured and sunbathing on the lawn just outside the room. And if the conditions are right, uh, in April time, we've got a chance of actually going under very strict conditions with researchers to actually spot leatherback turtles and see them laying their eggs. Really, really special occasion to see this event, usually under red light, apart from when they go into this kind of amazing um, position of laying their eggs. But once they're going back out to sea, we're back into our red light, uh, as you can see here. Other animals include the long-tongued bat, and in the evenings, we go out to see night wildlife, such as whip scorpions, tarantulas, geckos, and even one of my favourites here, the velvet worm, which is a predatory invertebrate feeding here on a centipede. And all sorts of different moths, like this silk moth. And on one occasion, we went out, went out very early in the morning, we got the chance to see this piping guan, this pheasant peacock-sized bird. We go down to the caves as well to see oil birds, which actually can echolocate and, and get fruit like figs off trees really, really special moment to see these birds. And just as I go through the remaining slides, just some beautiful variety of different wildlife that's, that's to see here. These are the swamps where we go. There's the chance for tree bearers overhead, two-eyed fish, which you can see above and below the water. And with rum punch in our hands, the chance to see flamingos, tiger herons, and also scarlet, scarlet, scarlet ibises coming in 
to roost in the evening. So a beautiful way to finish off with uh, Trinidad. And just in the last uh, minute and a half, two minutes or so, we then get a, a very small plane over towards Tobago. It's only a 20 minute flight or so. And we head up towards the very northeast of the island here, exploring the wetlands. And we're in a lovely hotel here, looking out across towards little Tobago Island. And here it is just in front of us here. So this gives us a chance to see beautiful sandy blue seas, laughing gulls, um, lots of different fish in the sea again, beautiful, beautiful reefs, stunning tropical king birds and wading birds. This is in uh, sort of March, April time. So these are birds that are wintering in the Caribbean from Alaska, for example. We've got turnstones, we've got um, spotted sandpipers, we've got yellow legs and we've got things like dowitchers and other sandpipers, for example. But here we've also got the chance to see other wildlife in the rainforest. Here we've got some leaf cutting ants, for example. And at this particular moment, we got to see a new, dra uh, new dragonfly, a new hummingbird, a hummingbird that's only otherwise found in Venezuela. It's the white tailed sabre wing with these beautiful white outer tail uh, wing feathers here. So beautiful chance to see the sabre wing. And one of my favourites as well, looks just like a blackbird, but it's a yellow legged thrush with this kind of sooty plumage and yellow legs. And a Trinidad Mot Mot with this wonderful pendulum like tail at the bottom there coming out to say hello. And just in my final slides, this is Little Tobago Island. Um, it's got lots of sheer waters on it. And in the north of the island, you get to see things like breeding brown boobies and one of my favorites, the red billed tropic bird. So my last few slides are just showing you some very lovely, cute photographs of this baby red billed tropic bird here and uh, a slightly bigger youngster. So because it's the tropics, they're nesting at slightly different times to each other. So there's the baby. And at the same time, we have this beautiful juvenile, which actually fledged um, while we were there. So I hope that that's taken you on a, a very quick but, but beautiful journey of St. Lucia, Trinidad and Tobago, and just giving you a flavour of the wonderful variety of wildlife um, that you're actually able to see there. I'm going to hand over to Byron now, and Byron is going to uh, provide us with all the delicacies that, that Cuba and the Caribbean has to offer. Thank you, Ed. Wow, what a, what a fantastic uh, presentation. I'm sure everybody's already um, uh, transported there. You have transported us to, to this uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, two islands, Ed. Um, now, um, I'm going to take you guys um, a little bit further north. My name is Byron Palacios, and I'm um, um, being a wildlife consultant and tour leader for Nature Trip for the last uh, nearly 20 years. Uh, I'm Ecuadorian and uh, based in uh, West uh, Dorset here in the UK. And uh, well, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure sharing with you another, another beautiful uh, experience of these virtual slideshows. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about a wonderful island, the largest island in the Caribbean region, Cuba. Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. Who haven't heard about Cuba? Um, Many, many, many uh, things come from Cuba, you know, from the famous, worldwide famous cigars, rum, uh, salsa, son, uh, bachata, all this kind of fantastic music, to the very, very famous revolution. So Cuba, it's uh, not just wildlife, it's a lot more, it's a very, very particular country in terms of uh, what's going on there, and I'm going to take you in the time machine, if that's where we can, we can put it as, and transported you to this beautiful island of Cuba. Um, Cuba stands right in the south tip of um, 90, 90 miles uh, from the southernmost uh, tip of the USA, Florida. That's, that's the sort of key west area. It's just a narrow, narrow uh, um, stretch between, between um, uh, the USA, I mean, Florida in this case, and the northwestern bit of, of, of Cuba. Uh, extends along the islands quite, quite long. Extends uh, more or less um, under 800 miles mm. from, from northwest to southwest. Uh, and a very, very long, long um, uh, highway we call the, the Carretera Central or the Central Highway. And basically our tour will take us throughout the whole hotspots and as uh, of Cuba. And, I know we, we, we based uh, the, 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 the whole tour of, um, um, in order to see the between 24 and 27 
species of, of birds that, that, that um, Cuba has got, but also there's plenty of the things to see, endemic uh, um, uh, lizards, butterflies, all sorts of um, beautiful landscapes and people, people history, particularly in this island because they've been left since uh, the revolution years which took place in 1959. They've been left uh, way behind due to commercial uh, sanctions, blockage from a part of the, of the international community. But Cubans have managed to sort it out and they're still, they're still going, living admirably under this obsolete uh, system. We're gonna start our, our um, journey landing in Havana, a direct flight from the UK, um, put us straight down there in Havana and after um, an hour and a half from, from uh, where we are, you see our course landing in Havana, a good hour and a half journey would put us in the northwest area of Pinar del Rio. Um, get us to a very lovely hotel, all quite basic, you know, it looks like a 50s. You see the time is, has stopped in, in Cuba in general. So this lovely hotel, like going back in the sort of fancy 50s or 60s, um, uh, holiday resorts, put us on a very, very comfortable accommodation with lovely balconies and he, fantastic, fantastic uh, um, scenery of the Guira Mountains, all these uh, limestone mountains covered under vegetation where the um, idyllic uh, refuge for the Che Guevara, the famous uh, Che Guevara during the, uh, the, the October, the missile cry of the mother, the, missile crisis in October of uh, 1961. And um, you can still go there and see his office um, where he was living, you know, his bedroom, his um, um, kitchen, all under this cave. And we're starting with all the, the endemics are quite curious about our, our visitors, you know, going um, walking through the trails. This lovely Cuban trogon, the national bird, very, very common around throughout Cuba. You're going to be very, very, um, um, surprised how common some of the some of the endemic birds are. Some of them we have to work really hard for them. Some of them, the most of them are really really easy to see. This beautiful great lizard cuckoo is always skulking around any people's garden or on the hedges. We have a green Cuban green woodpecker, beautiful as well, beautiful, um, uh, and and the list goes and goes. Cuban emerald, one of the two species uh, of hummingbirds of the island. Cuban emerald, beautiful. Again, you can see them nearby everywhere. And if you, if you hear while walking this sort of cracking, cracking call, it's not the less the beautiful Cuban toady. Tiny little bit of the size of a gold crest, just hoping around the branches beautifully, beautifully. It's just stunning. One of the stars and reasons of visiting this northwest tip of the island is the Cuban solitaire. I know it looks like a real brown job, but it's very important, really, really rare and endangered species, and is found just in this spot in Cuba, um, but produces a wonderful, wonderful, huge metallic band uh, call that is really easy to, to hear throughout the woods. Um, beautiful American kestrels can be also be seen nearby. This is the, the, the brown morph. The Western Spindalis or tree striped tanager as well. Stunning little bird quite coming around. And reptiles. This is a brown anole, um, one of the water brown anole, one of the water species of, of local native um, lizards. Then we're moving on to different uh, huge states, impressive uh, properties left uh, after the, the revolution. Their, their owners fled the country after, after all the revolution and they, all these properties became part of, of the uh, country uh, patrimony. In this case, olive capped warbler is another of the uh, new endemics that we're gonna be looking for, fairly easy to see in the, in the sort of mixture conifer and uh, cecropia trees, beautiful birds on this uh, uh, lovely, lovely flowers of uh, melastomis and, and beautiful red leg uh, honey creeper, very common around and you can easily see them really low. Another endemic, Fernandina flicker. Uh, if we're lucky, we can find them like this in this. Um, once you find a nest, they're really confident and really 
used to people and the, the, the tell you as well, by the way, the, the, the photography opportunities is amazing in this, in this audience. So bring on your camera with you when, when you are with us exploring the island. Cuban uh, grass grid as well, uh, male and female here. Um, it was, um, oh, the photo is not that great, probably after a few rums. Um, and uh, then, you know, after visiting Pinal del Rio, we're gonna hit the central highway. As you can see, really, really straight road that cuts a, a cube in half, you know, from, from one tip to the other. And, uh, and this is actually a photo I took um, uh, last year um, and, and I saw it to this part of media. And uh, you can see all the typical people in bicycles and a 1950s American big car. So we're gonna travel a good three hours by Havana again towards a beautiful iconic reserve, the marshes of Zapata. The Zapata's Biosphere Reserve, beautiful marshes. And you can see in the map how big the reserve is in comparison to the whole size of the island. Uh, Cuba covers 110,000 square kilometers to give you an idea. But if you see the size of, of the Zapata National Park, the, the, the marshes, it's just a stunning, it's just huge, massive. This is the main entrance. We're gonna explore all the area in red, which covers Difficult, I mean, um, difficult terrain, but also different types of habitats. So we're going to be looking between areas of Atlantic um, gallery forest and also uh, thorn and thick uh, um, seasonally flooded uh, forest, and as well salt pans and and coastal um, vegetation areas. The start of this trip. The start of the streets and we can easily find in the Zapata Peninsula is the smallest bird on earth, the amazing bee hummingbird. And again, I'll, I'll take you to places that we can easily see them meandering around, uh, either in a in a in a, a bird feeder together with a Cuban emerald. Um, but also, we'll have chances to see them perch and feed them from native flowers amazing bird a lot of people really is, is like one of the lifetime uh, birds uh, to see you know that you must see before before anything else um also all, all the birds like cuban oriole on the top of the screen we have there and um, some of the american migrants this um, black-throated blue warbler then the accommodation and and in, in cuba as you can see is basic i call it basic but um it's very clean nice you have a comfortable bed the food is really good the food um of cuba is quite very as um quite various as ed was saying you know you've got a mixture of of uh, loads of of um of continents and local stuff and it's quite adaptable to a lot of diets which is the main thing so comfortable rooms will take us out to the field um, and we're going to go on the on the seasonally flooded uh, forest or gallery forest, which produce another two endemics. And these are fantastic quail doves. On top we have blue crowned quail dove and <laughs> the bottom gray headed quail dove. A fantastic secretive birds that putting an effort, we can see them really quietly. And sometimes they come feed literally to our feet. More friend than Dina Flicker, this time out on the ground, male and female. Another fantastic bird, very cryptic owl, as you can see here. This is bare-legged owl or Cuban screech owl, beautiful. And again, we can find it really easily amongst flocks of a lot of uh, American warblers that visit during the winter. We have Swainson's at the bottom here, Swainson's uh, warbler, and on the top we have uh, um, warm-eating warbler. Sorry, I just came blank there. Um, again, the owl could be found in, in some spots in this reserve. Uh, some of the ranges are incredibly uh, great to see them. And we have also La Sagres flycatcher, one other one, endemic birds there. We can also bump into this beautiful Stygian owl and, and, and another Cuban endemic, Cuban Niger, roosting during the day on the on these uh, for the birds. And as I said to you earlier on, we'll have chances to see a bee hummingbird feeding naturally on this beautiful Pipansia um, flowers. Then moving on a little bit uh, in some of the calcareous um, uh, um, coast, coastal bit, very sharp um, um, 
stones there, uh, producing, you know, these banks of cenotes or water, home of um, Antillian terrapins on top, and another reptile endemic, Cuban crocodile. And as I said to you, the reptiles are fascinating in Cuba. We have this, another endemic night um, lizard of night anoli, uh, this um, blue anoli as well, male and female, beautiful things that um, you know, are, are going to blow our mind and keep us busy every every second down there. Um, another big part of the of the reserve and ma the majority of, of this habitat is obviously the marshes. The marshes of Zapata were going to be drifting down the canals very quietly, very quietly. Especially if you find if we're trying to find this bird, Zapata wren, one of the rarest birds on the planet Earth. One of the rarest bird which a very very limited. Um, uh, um, habitat and no more than a handful of uh, 100 or nearly 100 pairs left in the wild. Um, also, Zapata sparrow, really easy to see. This is the southern race. We can see a further afield uh, uh, the northern race, but this one is also very important to see here. And red shoulder blackbird, another endemic of the marshes. Uh, we can bump into some of mammals. I mean, the island is not really rich in mammals in general. Um, but um, we can bump into these tree hutias, which are something between a massive rat and a beaver. They live near the water and uh, clump together like this on the tree forks uh, looking at us while passing on the boat. As I said before, reptiles are not the ones to overlook to like uh, this beautiful Baltic uh, lizard on top and a curly tail, beautiful um, and very common, easy to see. Um, uh, lizards. From the, the Zapata Peninsula, we travel down, down, down um, um, towards the Oriente area. Cuba is split in two, the Western and the Oriente or the Eastlands. So we're going to cross this um, half border here, which is the Sierra de Cubitas, it splits the island in half. And we're going to go to Camagüey. Now Camagüey is a very picturesque and also quite Full of spirit town, but we're going to be, you know, exploring this very beautiful and ancient um, uh, Santonia, as they call a uh, uh, town. Um, and after a good rest, the following day, we're going to visit the Sierra de Chorrillos or Nahasa National Park, which is going to produce more endemics like this uh, giant kingbird, easily seen along the wires. Big, big size. It's a fly catcher of the size of a jackdaw. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, Cuban raven or Cuban crow as well can be seen here, another endemic. And uh, most of the pirates, as, as, as um, um, many of, of in, in the Caribbean islands, many um, endemic pirates, we have Cuban Amazon or Cuban Amazon parrot as well. Gundalash hawk, the terror of the, of the forest out there. A very, very uh, ruthless predator um, is also another another bird that we can see here, uh, together with some American warblers in the woods, like this Cape May warbler. But you can see this beautiful raptor, this beautiful accipiter soaring the skies of this reserve. Cuban palm crow is another bird that we can easily see in this reserve. More Cuban trogons and the beautiful Cuban parakeets, very very noisy birds, but beautiful to watch. As every single country in the Neotropics got this endemic uh, pygmyal, well, this is the Cuban pygmyal, uh, again, quite widespread in the, in the island, together with a beautiful Cuban toad that we're going to see many times, as well as the Cuban trogon again. We'll never get tired to see these birds. Cuban vireo as well, very easy to see. Then after all these overwhelming um, wildlife and, and birds and everything, we're going to retire or arrive to back to Camagüey to enjoy a little bit of a, of a meandering in town, exploring its people, you know, how do they live a weekend or a labor day life, and why not in the evening, some music. Music are always present in Cuba, everywhere. From there, we're going to move um, uh, up north and we're going to cross this huge, huge causeway built stone by stone, stone by stone manually uh, by um, um, the, the revolution. Fidel Castro was saying, just put sand and rocks and we'll see, we'll get there. 
So the parapping is 16 kilometers into Cayo Coco. Cayo Coco, um, it's a beautiful um, area, as you can see, beautiful beaches. We have a chance to relax there and also enjoy the um, all the all-inclusive um, uh, services of, of resorts, fantastic food and drinks. And also the wildlife around, just around from your room, American flamingos, roseate spoonbills, and one another, another endemic uh, Cuban black hawk, Cuban bullfinch. And this is the northern race of the Cuban or Zapata, sorry, Zapata sparrow. Oh, my favorite warbler, Oriente warbler, another endemic. And some birds are really easy to see, as I said, some endemics. Others, we have to work a bit hard like this one, Bahama mockingbird. Beautiful as well, really nice. And to close, but not the least, this is a very hard bird to see, but we often see it. This is the Cuban net catcher, beautiful thing. Um, alongside of this beautiful West Indian whistling dogs, which as well are really easy to spot. Sometimes on trees like this one, very unusual for a dog to be. And some waders as well, like piping plover, which is a very important wader, and things like royal terns, and many, many, many more, many more pan warblers, um, oven bird, American climatoris. Oh, you're going to be really busy every day. Our final drive takes us from Cayo Coco all the way up to Havana in six hours and 25 minutes. But we're going to break our journey having a lovely lunch along the uh, Central Highway in the uh, very, very uh, endemic city of Santa Clara. This is where El Che Guevara started his, his uh, took all his troops back to Havana after the triumph of the revolution on the 31st of January of 1958. Um, we're going to have chances to get off here, uh, see the mausoleum, uh, the monument, and why not grabbing some birds like this uh, beautiful red leg thrush, um, Antillian pond swifts roaming around, this lovely West Indies with pecker will be often at the restaurant where we're having lunch in Santa Clara. And uh, the, the Alisonia nollis, Alisonia lizard up on the top, and yellow throated warbler, another of the American warblers that visit the island in the winter. Again, more cuckoos, great lizard cuckoo, and the lovely Cuban peewee. Back in Havana, the very enigmatic city, uh, once the, the Las Vegas of the USA big um, companies uh, or, or CEOs or rich American people. Um, Obviously, we're going to come back to our, our beautiful hotel uh, located in a very, very picturesque area of, of the city and explore on a city tour the following day, um, exploring its cities, the main monuments, the main fortresses, um, um, and all the people's day-by-day -day life of, on the big city of Havana. And why not taking a little uh, look at this beautiful uh, cars like this Audi, Audi A1 <laughs> that you can still find them down there. I think this is uh, 1962 or so, something like that anyway. And why not visiting um, one of the main producers of, of, of Cuba, the cigars. We're going to visit uh, factories to see when people make them, how do they roll them up, and we can enjoy them as well with a glass of, of um, um, rum. <laughs> uh, probably that that evening. Um, so this is this is Cuba, uh, my friends, and I, I really hope uh, one day I will be able to show you this um, in 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 person. So please feel free to ask any questions and um, any 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 uh, that you go through your mind about this beautiful island. Just let us know, um, and I'm I'm here to help you happily. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to pass you over to. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to enjoy my Cuba cigar myself. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Byron, and thank you so much, Ed, as well. Uh, if any of you have any questions on the destinations we've covered so far, then please do just start firing them in. I see one that's come in already, a couple, yeah, starting to come in. So please do start firing those at us. That's no problem. We'll start answering those. We're going to go to a short break now. Um, of just over five minutes. We'll be back at 25 past eight, where we're going to go to Puerto Rico and Jamaica. So we'll see you at 25 past eight. Thank you. Thank you.
come into the corner of the room. Right, welcome back everybody. And I'm now gonna hand over to Andy, who's taking us to Puerto Rico. Over to you, Andy. Thank you very much, Sarah. And um, an apology first, I was just shouting at my kids there to get off our internet when Sarah's lovely Bob Marley music was played. So I do apologize for that. Sarah's WhatsApp me, Andy, put yourself on mute. Uh, so apologies folks, but we did get some nice Bob Marley there. Um, 
Well, great to be back. Uh, welcome to my home office here in Basingstoke in North Hampshire, where I spent most of the last year uh, based and trying to get the company through this pandemic. But as Sarah said at the outset, what a positivity, uh, you know, what a positive feeling we're, we're getting from delivering these series of talks. It's great to be with you all again this evening. Um, I'm going to be taking you to uh, Puerto Rico tonight. Uh, it's an island that I know particularly well for reasons that will become uh, evidence shortly. Uh, we ran our first ever tour to Puerto Rico just before the pandemic struck early on in 2020 and it was a great success. Uh, it's a 10 day tour, lovely winter sunshine and a good attempt at seeing the 17 endemic birds uh, that are present on the island. So uh, as usual let's quickly get our bearings. Uh, we've already seen St Lucia and Trinidad and Cuba. I loved uh, Ed's and Byron's two talks and you should see mine and Tom's talks this evening. Uh, you will see threads of commonality threading through the talks, as you would expect, I guess, in a geographical area like this. Uh, Puerto Rico is the easternmost of the Greater Antilles. So here's Cuba, uh, where we were, were before the break with Byron. Next, we have Hispaniola, comprising of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, and here is Puerto Rico here, uh, just across the Mona Passage with uh, the US Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands, and all the ex-British colonies, the Les Fantilles uh, branching out in an arc down to uh, Venezuela. Now, Puerto Rico very rarely appears on the news uh, here in the UK. We very rarely hear uh, too much about it. So just to give a little bit of background, I thought I'd just uh, talk briefly about the history and uh, some modern day famous Puerto Ricans. So uh, Christopher Columbus arrived in Puerto Rico in November uh, 1493 on his first, uh, sorry, second journey to the Americas. And uh, upon arrival, he was greeted with the Taino Indians. Uh, by all accounts from those early Spanish chronicles, a very welcoming, uh, gentle race. Um, but such was the, uh, uh, the happenings in, in the Caribbean in the 50 years after the Spanish arrived that their numbers were greatly decimated. Just uh, 50 years after the Spanish arrived, the numbers had decreased from about 30,000 to just a few hundred. Uh, that's partly down to the hard labour enforced by the, the Spanish colonists, but also the, uh, the diseases, not the smallpox, smallpox brought in uh, by the Europeans. Um, the Taino name for Puerto Rico was Borinquin, and Puerto Ricans themselves uh, are known as Boricuas. That's where that word comes from. Um, as I say, we're very, Puerto Rico is very rarely in the news, but some well-known faces you might have heard of. Lynn manuel Miranda, top left, who brought Hamilton uh, to uh, Broadway and the West End uh, two or three years ago. Um, on the right here, we have Jennifer Lopez, who I thought was fantastic in the presidential uh, inauguration um, uh, last week. Uh, Jennifer Lopez is a New Rican, uh, so-called. Uh, she was actually born in New York, born and raised in New, in New York of, of Puerto Rican immigrant parents. Uh, Luis Fonsi, down in the bottom center there, the artist behind the mega 2017 hit uh, Despacito. Uh, the video for that song is the most viewed YouTube video of all time. And the well-known actor turned director, uh, bottom left here, uh, Benicio del Toro. But um, casting aside all of these Puerto Ricans aside, and let me just mention there, of course, in the top, Gabriel Lugo. Uh, I've been associated with Puerto Rico for 20 years, but it took me until last year to finally get a tour off the ground and uh, one of the reasons was the lack of a quality birding guide, but I have got to know Gabriel over the last couple of years. Uh, a lovely guy, top quality birder and host, and he led our tour last year and uh, will be your companion and guide should you choose to travel there with us. Uh, but the most uh, important Puerto Rican from my point of view um, is my wife, who's from the island, and uh, I've persuaded her to join me uh, for a couple of minutes this evening just to um, talk through a couple of questions. Here's my wife Maritza who's going to join me. Hi everybody, hi. Um, now the politics of Puerto Rico is a bit of a mystery to us Europeans. So just tell people tonight uh, a bit about uh, Puerto Rico, where it stands politically at the moment. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Puerto Rico is a commonwealth of the United States, uh, but possibly not in the same sense as it's understood in this country. Uh, so it is specifically uh, an Estado Libre Asociado, which is a free associated state. Um, so what that means is that to a big extent, um, we're kind of like a state of the United States in terms of institutional configuration and following federal um, policy and legislation, but we also retain some freedoms. 
uh, Puerto Rico was ceded um, by the Spanish um, to the USA in 1898 as part of the um, Spanish-American um, War. And in 1917, Puerto Ricans became American citizens. And so we are all American citizens by birth. Um, both English and Spanish are official languages in the island. Um, so really Puerto Rican identity is like that blend of Latin, Spanish, and also um, US American kind of culture. So it's a really unique culture. Uh, we've been through the referendum, of course, in the UK over the past few years. Uh, we seem to have come to the almost the end of that process now. There's, there's still a lot of work to, to do, but referendums actually come up on the Puerto Rican yeah. political landscape quite often. Yeah. How often does a referendum happen in the island and what choices are on the table when that happens? Yeah. So to be honest, when I think of referendums in the island, I, I feel as if they happen all the time. But actually, they've happened six times since 1967. Uh, the first one that I took part in was in 1993. And there were three options there. So the first one was to remain the status quo, what we what we are or still are, which is a um, associated free state. Uh, to become a state of the union, a state of the United States, therefore the 51st state, or to become a nation, uh, an independent nation. Um, in 1993, uh, remaining as we are won the referendum, really closely followed by becoming a state of the United States. And that has been the result in every referendum, except for one that took place last year in November. Um, we had a referendum in no November 2020 alongside the uh, general elections. Um, and as we, as Possibly, as you know, we follow the same electoral timetable as the United States every November, every four years. So this referendum took place in November, uh, and different from the other five, um, there were only there was only one option. So the option was, do you want to be a state or do you not? So the options were yes or no, which happens to be the question that it has been asked to other states of the United States before they become a state. And um, state one, um, fifty-two percent to forty-eight percent no. Uh, now, what that means is yet to be seen. Okay, great. In a nutshell, what uh, do you, when you see the island, what makes it so special for you? What qualities does Puerto Rico have? Gosh, I'm a Boricua, Boricua fully. Um, I love the island. Um, and growing up in Puerto Rico, I'm from San Juan, which is the capital city. It's a really vibrant and dynamic city, as you would expect, you know, of every capital city. But it happens to be a coastal city, which means that we had really easy access to the sea. And so growing up, the sea was part of my life really on a daily basis. So the smell of the sea, the warmth, I, I guess we enjoy the fact that it's so warm, the, the sea that you can go there any time of the year and just go and have a chapuzón um, and just enjoy the, the, the sea. And also the fact that the waters are so clear, there's a lot of color. So if you, in my case, I, do, I love snorkeling and scuba diving. So you can enjoy amazing, beautiful marine life on the corals. And that really is very special. And also I miss the sound um, of the coqui. Uh, I guess you haven't talked about that yet, but the coqui is a, it's a little frog that is endemic to the island. And it makes a beautiful sound um, day and night. So it's always in the background. You take that for granted when you live in the island. And then when you leave, you miss it. Um, I also miss the food. The food is exquisite. Um, a lot of plantain-based and fish-based uh, dishes. Uh, particularly, I miss the people, the people and the characters of Puerto Rican. Uh, and again, with that blend of Latin and, um, and American, so extremely open, passionate, friendly, and at the same time, very driven and um, very um, wanting to innovate. And lastly, the ecosystems, the diversity of ecosystems, beautiful place. So I love the island. I, for me, it's the best place in the world. And uh, I guess I'm biased, but I encourage everybody that is listening to go and visit it and find that for yourselves and make that decision. Okay, just before we get on to the first, just a quick comment on each of these four typical Puerto Rican dishes there. Okay, uh, so we have a, at the top uh, left, we've got arroz con habichuelas and tostones. Tostones is a, a beautiful uh, kind of uh, dish that is made with um, uh, plantain. And then we've got mofongo on the other side uh, with uh, prawns. And then we've got arroz con gandules and lechon asao, which is a uh, pork. And uh, we love stew, so that's a lamb stew that is also quite typical. That's great. I hope that gives you a bit of a flavour uh, of the island from someone who's who's lived and, and grown up there. So that's great, Lisa. Thanks very much. Thank you. Right, let's continue our tour. Um, I'll just give you a, 
an outline now. Yeah, here's, here's the San Juan metropolis with uh, Vieques and uh, Culebra. Uh, here are the British Virgin Islands and the, the US Virgin Islands, Isla de Mona and the Dominican Republic here. We, we fly into San Juan and then explore the cast belt here uh, along the north of Puerto Rico's coast. And then we head down right down to the southwest to Parguera and the dry forest of Wanaga before we wend our way back through the island to explore the tropical forest of El Yunque and uh, some snorkeling off the north east coast here before ending our tour back in San Juan. So here's an aerial view of San Juan with the, uh, the uh, Castillo de San Felipe here protecting the harbour, the old Spanish castle, uh, the historic centre of San Juan and then Condado and Isla Verde and all the, the hotels and office buildings and, and tourist district up here uh, to the west. So we will head uh, along the north coast through, as I say, Puerto Rico's cast belt, limestone substrate here. And you can see these giant haystacks, which are only prevalent really in Puerto Rico and in China. You won't find them anywhere else. And just to give you an idea of the scale of the topography here, here's the famous satellite dish and observatory of Arecibo. Um, you may remember the 1995 uh, Bond film, Goldfinger, Pierce Brosnan uh, was involved in that one as Bond. Uh, and, and there was a long action sequence set uh, here at Arecibo and also the 1997 film uh, with Jody, uh, called Contact with Jodie Foster. Um, so this is such difficult topography that the island's uh, most uh, protected forests are, are included in this area. It's very difficult to road build or do any other engineering projects. So, uh, we can actually sweep up a lot of Puerto Rico's birds just in the first day. Uh, probably the most common bird in the island is the banana quit, locally called Reinita, the little queen, um, ubiquitous all, all throughout Puerto Rico's habitats. But we quickly get into some of the wider Caribbean specialities like red-legged red thrush and some of the uh, Puerto Rican endemics. And, and this is really where you'll uh, weave a thread between Ed's talk and Byron's talk and my talk and Tom's talk, because some of these birds are island endemics, yet uh, superficially uh, from, uh, very similar to a neighboring islands equivalent birds. So this is the Puerto Rican bullfinch, uh, the Puerto Rican flycatcher, uh, the Puerto Rican vireo, not dissimilar to, to the Cuban vireo that Byron showed you a few minutes ago, uh, the Puerto Rican spindalis, uh, the Puerto Rican woodpecker, uh, this is a Puerto Rican emerald. Pretty much every bird here is prefixed with the term Puerto Rico, as you uh, probably gathered by now. Uh, however, this is the uh, Antillean mango or green mango. Uh, Gabriel will take us to a friend's house, which has uh, a lovely veranda and hummingbird feeders, and we'll pre pretty much see all the Puerto Ricans hummingbirds in that one lunch stop. Uh, and the green-throated carib, which uh, I think Ed mentioned earlier on. Uh, from a birding perspective, one of the attractions, I think, of visiting uh, one of these Caribbean islands is not just the, the wonderful weather and culture and food at a really dank time of year for us northerners, but it's the chance in birding pardons to sweep up or clean up. Uh, so you can visit one of the great Antilles and, and have a, a pretty good shot at from a birding perspective, seeing everything that's available. And if you keep a life list, not having to go back there again, to, to get any different species. This is a Puerto Rican endemic, the Adelaide's warbler, uh, named after the daughter of uh, the first bird that ever captured a large specimen, Robert Swift. Uh, this is the Puerto Rican toady, uh, San Pedrito in Spanish, uh, a nod to St. Peter, um, very similar to the Cuban toady. There are actually five uh, endemic uh, toadies in the Greater Antilles. I think Hispaniola has two, Haiti has one, and Dominican Republic has one. Uh, Jamaica has one, Cuba has one, and Puerto Rico has one. This is uh, this won the bird of the tour um, when we did a little survey in the airport uh, on the way back in early March last year. Uh, the star bird, but a really difficult one, one to see these days, is the uh, Puerto Rican parrot uh, clinging on to existence, heavily impacted by the hurricanes that sweep periodically through. Uh, Puerto Rico, but um, the US National Forest Service is working very hard to conserve this species. And uh, there are a couple of active reintroduction sites which are heavily protected, which we can't get into as visitors. So a chance flyby is probably our, our best hope uh, of a sighting. Uh, another endemic here, uh, this is the Elfin Woods Warbler, uh, not discovered until 1968, would you believe, and not described until 1972. Uh, we'll see this in the mountains as we drive from north to south. And our destination, as I said, down in the far southwest of Puerto Rico, 
um, is uh, the town of Parguera and uh, Cabo Rojo here with uh, the lighthouse, uh, lovely Caribbean beaches here and uh, a unique uh, Caribbean dry forest uh, in, in which and around we'll see the endemic yellow-shouldered blackbird and we'll take time to explore the uh, hot and dry Guanaca dry forest. Some special species here that we won't see elsewhere, um, the Puerto Rican lizard uh, cuckoo, uh, the Puerto Rican screech owl, and uh, the Puerto Rican nightjar, although we, we will realistically only get views um, as they caught in our, in our torch beams after dark. <clears throat> uh, Pargueda and um, one or two other sites around Puerto Rico are very well known for the uh, for the bioluminescence uh, caused by uh, tiny sea creatures emitting uh, light due to a, a chemical reaction when agitated. And this is uh, quite a money spinner for the Puerto Rican tourism uh, scene. And uh, if you still have energy after our birdwatching activities, we can go out either in kayaks or on a larger boat uh, to, to see the, this uh, natural phenomena. Uh, Marissa mentioned the cocky, the much loved cocky, um, which uh, the sound of which is synonymous with Puerto Rico. And uh, I'll play you the, the sound in a minute. The first syllable is uh, supposedly to ward off other male intruders and the second syllable uh, attracts attendant females. But as Marissa said, uh, this is a beautiful sound and it's, uh, you hear it whether you're in downtown San Juan or up in the mountains or on a palm fringe beach uh, every single night. That just takes me right back there. And uh, that little animal um, is uh, yeah, a part of Puerto Rican folklore and uh, features heavily in children's literature, lovely little creature. So wending our way back to the northeast of the island, we'll, we'll go back through the mountains, which peak at about 1,400 meters, about the height of Ben Nevis in Scotland. Uh, we'll do a couple of birding stops for things like white crowned pigeon. And then we'll drop in on uh, El Yunque National Forest, the largest tropical, in fact, the only tropical forest in the whole of the US National Park system. It's one of Puerto Rico's great treasures. Um, and we'll spend the whole day walking the, the trails here, soaking up the atmosphere, doing some bird watching. Although realistically, by this point, we, we would have seen almost all birds available to us on the island. But it's just a different habitat to anything we've seen thus far. And uh, from uh, some of the viewpoints will get lovely views out towards the Atlantic coast. Uh, arriving in Fajardo, right up on the northeastern coast of Puerto Rico, uh, we will see this bird that Ed mentioned earlier, the Antillean crested hummingbird, here in its uh, westernmost extremity uh, of its range, so uh, just clinging on uh, on the eastern coast of Puerto Rico. Uh, but just to kind of round off the tour, um, Ed mentioned some of the reefs and the snorkeling. Well, here in Puerto Rico, we have some of the best reefs and uh, snorkeling conditions and corals in the Western Hemisphere. We will take to the sea for a day, either on a diving boat or a catamaran, uh, with uh, an ice box full of cold drinks and uh, tropical fruits. And we'll just spend the day doing some sea watching uh, for brown boobies and other seabirds and just swimming and snorkeling over these magnificent reefs. And it's a lovely way uh, to, to round off the tour. You can have a green tea tur sea turtle cruise by or a barracuda, uh, myriad tropical fishes and some outstanding corals and it's a, a lovely way to, to spend the day. Uh, magnificent uh, pristine condition, um, these uh, Caribbean reefs. And there from there it's just an hour and a half, two hour drive back to San Juan where we wind up the tour. Have a full day in the capital by looking at the uh, the 15th century Castillo, uh, well, sorry, 16th to 18th century uh, was when it was built. Uh, building got underway in 1539, as I say, it protects the natural harbour of uh, San Juan. And then we'll gently stroll around the capital shady streets, colourful shady streets. Um, it's a lovely picturesque place. Some of you may have uh, been here before. You might have done a Caribbean cruise. San Juan is a very popular drop off point. Uh, for, for the big Caribbean cruises. So on some days you can find historic San Juan is, uh, is quite busy. But we'll take you to um, the bar in uh, historic San Juan where the Pina Colada uh, was first invented in 1963. I say you haven't had a Pina Colada until you've had one. 
uh, in Old San Juan. Delicious um, cocktail. And over to the right there, the local Peraguas, much loved by Puerto Rican children. The best way I can describe this is uh, like a slush puppy. You can see a, a big block of ice there and the vendor will scrape uh, sh uh, shavings of ice off with a special tool into a cup and then pour your um, your favorite syrup flavor on top, be it um, raspberry or strawberry or one of the tropical fruits. It's a lovely way to cool down in the middle of the afternoon. So that gives you a, a bit of a flavor for Puerto Rico, uh, a very undervisited island from the British perspective. Norwegian flew there for about three years direct, but unfortunately they've, in the wake of the pandemic, said that they're going to focus on short haul routes now, which means we're back uh, to fly via Spain or the United States. But I think it's a great choice uh, for a, a mid or late winter break, combining some bird watching culture and some relaxation. And uh, one question that's actually put to us the other evening, I think it's well worthwhile myself and the, the ops teams uh, grappling with, and that is what are these islands and, and holidays in the Caribbean and Central America, can you combine? Because we get a feeling listening to you that actually after the pandemic, uh, people are A, going to be really keen to travel and B, to make the most of their airfares and maybe combine some of these uh, islands into, into a longer holiday. So that's Puerto Rico for you. And I'm now looking forward to uh, listening to uh, Tom uh, speak on Jamaica. So over to you, Tom. Great, thank you, Andy. And Maritza, really enjoyed that. Um, I actually hear the cocky quite a lot in my household. My, my little boy who's almost two has a sound book, so he plays that all the time. So we hear the, that little frog all the time in our household. So I enjoy listening to that. Now, let me just share my screen with you and then we'll get going to Jamaica. Go. Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Mabbott. Um, I'm um, an operations manager for Nature Trek. I work full time um, for Nature Trek, looking after a whole range of different tours um, across the world. And I've been lucky to, to, to lead over 50 tours now, lots across the UK, Europe. Um, yeah, all across the globe, really, including to Jamaica. So I set this tour up a couple of years after after joining Nature Trek, um, and then yeah, a tour to Jamaica on a quest to see all the endemic species. That's a running theme through these talks, of course, is the amazing endemism. So I'll, uh, for the next twenty minutes, I'll, I'll take you there and show you some of the highlights. So Jamaica is the, the third largest island, so a member of the of the Great Antilles. You've seen the geography before on on other slides. Um, so it's around 150 miles long and about 50 miles um, wide and uh, and yeah so we, we we reach here on a there is a direct flight and so we, we reach a we reach on a direct flight into into Kingston a BA flight um, and as I was saying it's a very very high level of endemism and it was actually thought that Jamaica was never attached to the mainland so that is a, a reason for its extremely high um, you know level of endemism there's over there's 30 endemic bird species, that's more than any other of the Caribbean islands. Two of those are extremely rare or possibly extinct. We've got a chance of seeing 28 um, bird species found nowhere else on Earth, um, 19 endemic subspecies, over 800 endemic plants, um, incredible range of endemic um, snails and uh, over 20 reptiles and amphibians as well. So just so many species that are found nowhere else on Earth. So a very exciting place to, place to visit. So as I said, we can arrive on a nice direct flight into Kingston, and we're really focusing during this tour on the on the eastern end of the island. Um, and we we land into Kingston, travel to the northeastern coast, um, and stay for the whole week. It's a single centre holiday. To stay for the whole whole week at Green Castle Eco Retreat, a really nice lodge um, on the northeast coast. And from there, um, we're taking it pretty relaxed, um, you know, the Jamaican way. And, uh, and spend a lot of time around the lodge and also um, dip into the other habitats around the island. So we, we, we have two days where we travel away to, um, to, to the John Crow Mountains and also the Blue Mountains to, to pick up some of the more tricky endemic species. So just a little bit more on the, on the geography and where, we're, and where we're heading when we, when we actually get to Jamaica. So we've got Kingston here, this is the, the, the Greencastle Lodge. And then a few of these little red dots are just areas we'll visit. The famous Hardware Gap area in the Blue Mountains, we'll, we'll do some birding around here. We'll also head over to the foothills of the, of the John Crow Mountains, just here. And then we'll travel along the coast on our, on our days away from, the, away from the lodge and just get a feel for local life, stopping in Boston Bay for a, 
a um, bit of a church chicken lunch and, and see what local life is like um, and Hope Bay for some birding. And there's a really nice spot not too far along the coast that we hope to see um, uh, what white gold streamer tails later on in the tour, but I'll come, I'll come to that. So our lodge is a, it, it's a really nice, um, really nice lodge. It's around a, a 1600 acre property um, and, and around 20 miles of trails head out from property through this really lush tropical um, forest. Uh, we've got access to the coast here, some coastal lagoons, a reservoir. Um, it's a, this is all within a, within a short walk really of our, of our base. There's lots and lots to see on the doorstep and that's why um, I've really chosen to, you know, to stay here you know, for, for the entire tour. So there's no moving around at all on this one. It's, uh, it's very relaxed. Just another photo of the lodge here. It's a, you know, quite a small place, so again, surrounded by um, great habitat, lots of um, you know, um, flowering trees and shrubs to bring in the birds. And just, a, just an awful, awful lot to see without going far. Really nice views from the, from the lawn and the grounds, heading, looking uh, eastwards towards the mountains, the, the blue mountains here in the distance, which we'll, which we'll visit and I'll, I'll come to. And very nice, um, clean, comfortable, well-appointed rooms, as you'd expect, with, with, with lovely views. And this holiday is ideal. It's, it's, it's in our bargain birding range, but it doesn't really fit the bill for that. Lots of those tours are a little bit faster paced. This, this tour, you, you will end up seeing all, if, if not you know, very nearly all of the endemic species of bird, but at a relaxed pace. Um, those that want to have a chill in the afternoon one day, no problem, you've got a lovely pool there, or you can wander down to the beach, and there's plenty of downtime as well as some you know, fantastic birding. And this is just a shot to show you the, the, you know, the, lo the lots of different trails that lead from the, from the, uh, the main lodge. So there's the main lodge here. You can walk a mile down to the coast and we'll cover these trails on, on, a, on five of the days. We won't actually be driving far at all. We might drive a little bit up the coast, but we'll just be walking all these trails down to the waterfall here, down to the reservoir, down to the coast and walking along the beach. And so there's, there's very little, little traveling for, for much, of this, uh, much of this holiday. Onto the wildlife then, and uh, now that's of course why we're here. And this is the maybe one of the first endemics you'll you'll see and you'll and you'll tick off in your book is the is the Jamaican mango. I'm coming here to to hummingbird feeders, um, and uh, as I said, there's there's 28 species that we'll that we'll try and see through the week. And in fact, 27 of the 28 have been seen in the grounds of, of the lodge itself. Um, although some of those very rarely, so that's why we head away for those two days to the mountains. But there's you know, many, many of the endemics we'll see um, without moving anywhere. Another Jama shot of Jamaica mango here, visiting one of the, the many sort of fruiting shrubs and um, trees in the garden. Um, wherever there's flowers, if you just sort of wait patiently, hummingbirds will zip in and you can get some really nice photos of them naturally feeding on, on flowers. And there's lots around the grounds here and lots of time to, to explore the grounds and, and take photographs. Here's a familiar slide. This is the Jamaican toady, an um, absolute little gem of a bird. Um, Andy spoke about the, the Puerto Rican toady and, and, uh, and Byron in Cuba. Um, absolutely exquisite little birds. Um, and they, they're quite fascinating. They actually excavate their own little nest chamber into, into sandy banks and, and, and muddy banks. And they'll just flit out from a branch and, and catch insects on the wing. So real, real star species and quite easily encountered, really, just, uh, just, you know, just outside your room um, in, the, in the forest surrounding the lodge a lot of the time. This is, a, the, the, this is the, the national bird of Jamaica, the red-billed streamer tail. Um, fantastic species. Uh, I'll come to its, its cousin, the black-billed streamer tail, um, a little later. But these two, these two streamer tails, endemic to Jamaica, um, that found nowhere else on the planet, and are very, very special indeed. And they, again, they will often pose for photos um, in the gardens here. Um, with these amazing long tail feathers. They're really, really super species. This little chap isn't an, isn't an endemic species, but it's a it's it's the vervain hummingbird. So thought of as the the second smallest bird in the world. So Byron brought you the the bee hummingbird, and this is the the, the vervain hummingbird. So it really is about the it's about the size of a bumblebee. When you stood next to a plant and something will buzz in, and you think, wow, is that is that a bee or is that a, a hummingbird? And it will be just be zipping around, poking its tiny little bill into these uh, into these flowers. Uh, fantastic little species, and uh, yeah, quite commonly commonly encountered. So there's not a, you won't be seeing a huge you know, you know, number of different species on the tour. Um, as, a, as Ed would say, you get far more you know, numbers of species that, you know, the, you know, the closer you are to the, to the mainland. But uh, we'll, we'll expect to see maybe 
you know, hundreds, between 100 and 120 species um, um, during the week. And this is a um, Jamaican woodpecker, the only resident woodpecker um, on the island. And, and again, um, we'll, we'll expect to see this, uh, this wonderful bird just walking the trails from the lodge. And another species, the orange quit, a bright blue bird with a orange, orange throat. So lots of big, you know, brightly coloured, fascinating birds that are, that are found um, nowhere else um, on the planet. So it's a, it's a wonderful place to be birding. Fun doesn't stop at night. We'll head out for, for night walks into the, into the forest um, and around the, just around the lodge grounds. We might come across a, a northern potu um, that's shown here. I like this photo. It just shows how large their eyes are, almost bulging out the side of their head. And they've, they, they've, they, they've had you know, very, very um, large eyes and a, you know, nocturnal, of course, feeding on, on moths and flying insects. And they will they will fly out almost fly catcher like from a perch they won't sort of sally around um, like night jars do they'll fly out so they often sit on top of pole telegraph poles and posts just around the grounds of the lodge um, and this is a this is an endemic subspecies um, that's only only found on, in Jamaica the guides often know where they're roosting um, so although the best chance is, is obviously at night when they're, when they're active they will use the same roost spot so often on a snapped branch and they'll just sit motionless um, and, uh, and blend in um, yeah, with, with their surroundings. And here you can even see, if you look really closely, a couple of little slits in the top of the eyelid. Um, this actually enables them to sense movement um, when, you know, when their eyes are still shut. Um, so uh, yeah, they, they're still keeping an eye on you when you're, even when they're roosting on their day roost, so you can't, get, you can't get too close. So lots and lots of birds. I'll just move away from the birds for a moment. As I was saying, there's plenty of time to, to be wandering around the grounds. You know, a typical day will um, head out first thing you know, early in the morning and when things are most active, of course, and then we'll have, you know, we'll, we'll come back and have at least you know, a really nice lunch at the lodge and then a couple of hours at least of, of downtime to have a nice swim, um, you know, explore yourself around the grounds, um, some, take some, some lovely photos or maybe have a walk down, to the, walk down to the beach. This is Jamaican white peacock, lots and lots of butterflies fluttering around the gardens and um, as well as all the birds, so lots of time just to explore yourself and just have a, a really relaxed time full of wildlife. This is golf fertility. On a short walk, you're down to the reservoir. Um, there's a, there's a you know, lovely walk through the forest, down to a different habitat where you might find northern chicana um, creeping around the, the edges of the lake. And out on the water, you know, all the birds you sort of dream of finding um, in the UK are, are all there on the reservoir. Um, in front of you, there'll be blue winged teal that you see here, and there'll also be lesser scorp, ring neck duck, um, American widgeon, and lots and lots of, of you know, very exciting species for us here in the UK. Lots of American, American coot, very, very common, sometimes find West Indian whistling duck, and on the sort of really um, sort of well vegetated lagoons, uh, mask duck as well. So uh, lots and lots of uh, species to enjoy. So as I said, we'll take two full days away from, away from the lodge and head into the mountains, into the, the John Crow Mountains and the, and the Blue Mountains. Um, you know, not too far away, but, uh, but we'll, we'll spend a full day out in these areas, trying to see some of the, 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 the endemic species that are the more likely to be found here. So this is the view from the, you know, from the Blue Mountains and the, the Hardware Gap area, really excellent birding here. The, the highest point gets up to just over 2,000 metres, but we won't be getting quite, quite that high up. Um, and, uh, and the Blue Mountains famous, uh, famous of course for, the, uh, for, for their coffee. So as well as the birding, we'll stop off and sample that and, uh, and dip into to, to local life as we're traveling around as well. Up here, this is another species we, you, we might well find, the wonderful Jamaican lizard cuckoo. Lots of other um, species can be found. Blue Mountain vireo, Jamaican peewee, arrow-headed warbler. I mean, a very good place for Jamaican blackbird. If you find these really amazing bromeliads, the blackbirds are often flitting around in there you know, and tossing leaves out and, and finding insects in the bromeliad. So lots and lots of species to find. And fitting with some of the other slides we've seen this evening, this is the Greater Antillean Bullfinch, um, which, we'll, which we'll hope to find up here. And one of the real stars is the, the crested quail dove. Um, I think it was Byron that bought you quail doves in Cuba. And this is the star endemic species um, in, in Jamaica. Can be one of the most difficult to, to find out of the 28 actually really likes the, the dense forest with a, quite a, a fairly clear understory. Um, but we have, we have a you know, great success with finding them and occasionally they'll come out onto the road and, and break full cover. Um, but uh, yeah, when, you know, when, when I was over there, it was a flutter of wings 
and it and thankfully it landed on a low branch and we managed to get good views of it but really really smart uh, smart dove this is a group birding along Ecclesdown Road another another famous sort of birding site I um, mean the John Crow Mountains and we'll you know it's a slightly lower elevation here and um, the highest point is around a thousand meters and we'll just be in the you know in, in, in the foothills just uh, yeah just seeing what we can find and some endemics that can only be really found along this uh, along this area, such as the the black billed streamer tail. So the red billed, very common around the lodge. We head to this area um, to see to see this uh, this fabulous bird. So we'll see both the streamer tails during during the week. As Andy was saying, most of these islands have their have their endemic parrots, and Jamaica is no different. This is the black billed parrot. We also have yellow billed parrot as well. Um, and uh, and and you know, the, the sad theme is that they're they they're still the, you know, these these species are declining in numbers as well, um, but in this in this area of, of, of pristine forest, you know, they're still found in, in fairly good numbers, thankfully, and we, we've got a good chance of finding them. This is a ring-tailed pigeon and other species that we'll find up in these slightly slightly higher elevations. So as we're travelling around, we'll be stopping at coastal bays and, and wetlands and pools, um, and just experiencing all the different habitats um, on offer in the area. This is uh, a snowy egret here. We'll stop off at you know. Little lagoons, we might find green herons, yellow crowned night herons, piebald grebes, um, belted kingfisher, um, so some other um, sort of Amer American species. Beautiful American kestrel, quite common as we're traveling around on, on wires and telegraph poles, stunning male here. And back at the lodge, we'll enjoy, um, we'll, we'll enjoy the cuisine, of course. One evening, we'll have a lovely barbecue down by the poolside. Um, very, very, you know, you know, you know, fun activity and and and, uh, and and relaxed tour. We'll also be stopping in on our days away from the lodge as well in in, in local towns to to experience the, the you know the food and local life. And here, here we are rustling up a jerk chicken barbecue. But um, as the other said, they cater very well for, for you know for all diets. Um, in Jamaica, really nice varied um, you know, varied menu. Um, so there's no problems there at all. This was a um, the chestnut bellied cuckoo, um, and when, when I, I was leading the first tour after um, over in Jamaica, and we we'd actually seen 26 of the 28 species after um, three or four days, and there was two to go. And this was the this was the penultimate bird, the chestnut bellied cuckoo, walking the just around the grounds of the lodge, and, and heard this fairly harsh call of the of this bird, and the, and that was the, the the next the next species achieved. Really smart cuckoo. Um, doesn't parasitize um, other birds like our like our cuckoo does, um, but uh, yeah, really, really special bird. And the final bird is the Jamaican owl. Um, Byron mentioned there's often a often end endemic owl species, and this is this is a uh, this is Jamaica's the, the fair, you know, a, a fairly nondescript brown owl, but it's a uh, yeah it's a, it's a cracking species to be found that on our uh, on one of the nights. That again they like to stick to a fairly routine um, roost spot. So we've got a, we've got a good chance of finding this. Uh, special species. Lots of um, wood warblers, we, um, you know, American wood warblers, we passing through at this, uh, this time of year, this black and white warbler foraging a bit natatch like on some uh, um, <clears throat> on mosses and lichens in the, in, in, the, in the trees and shrubs and we also find American red start, this is a female American red start, absolutely stunning male and so you know just step into any area of forest and these you know, beautiful American wood warblers will be just coming out at you. And a stunning black-throated blue warbler, absolute cracking birds. Just about a mile walk from the lodge or down to the coast. Um, you can swim um, and, 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 and there is snorkeling um, that, that can be done. We don't include it in the tour, but you've got plenty of downtime. So if you did want to walk down to the beach, you can, you can swim here. And um, this is Jack's Bay Beach and um, yeah, perfectly pleasant and safe. And there's a, you know, <clears throat> some nice birding here as well. Just a nice little walk along the beach. Semi-palmated sandpiper here. And then the mangroves, yellow crowned night heron, who actually kill deer, leaf sandpipers, um, and lots of other species. This is yellow warbler, <clears throat> likes the sort of mangrove habitat that we'll find down here. And again, um, anoles. There's lots of endemic um, you know, reptiles. Um, seven species of anole found here and nowhere else. This is Graham's anole, and they'll they'll extend this little throat patch, this orange throat patch, which is called a dewlap. Um, when there's another one around, they'll flick it out, a bit of a sort of defensive mechanism. Um, lots of these around the lodge, fascinating little creatures. This is a um, giant anole. I mentioned there's only over 500 different species of endemic snail on Jamaica. 
Um, so you, as you're walking the forest trails, you might come across this, uh, this isn't one of the endemics, this is Caribbean hermit crab. But it'll actually start its life in the sea and then spend, adapt to spend the rest of its life um, on land, crawling around in the forest um, and can live up to 40 years, quite an amazing species. So not far from the lodge, a very short drive along to, along to Robins Bay, um, just a little bit west of where we are, we've got the chance to see this very special bird, white-tailed tropic bird. Um, so there's a small um, breeding colony, so we'll head very early one morning, and that's often when they come into the, to the cliff face to, to make a, a change at the nest, and we can often get very close views of this, uh, of this stunning bird. And occasionally they come right overhead, with the, you can see this amazing long um, central tail stream, it's, um, yeah, fantastic species. And there'll be other birds offshore, magnificent frigate bird here, and a chance to see um, brown pelicans as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's the tour sort of in a, in a nutshell. As we travel back to, to Kingston, we'll be sure to, to stop off in the, in the port there, um, look for the brown, brown pelican colonies and uh, royal terns here, laughing gulls, um, sandwich tern up here, lots of other species. Um, and a chance to, to dip into a local market as well on our way back to the airport for our, for our direct flight home. And so so that sort of uh, finishes off the tour. If you think you're going to Jamaica, this is the book um, I, can, I can recommend. Really nice photographic guide, very clear, shows you all the birds to be found in Jamaica and very clearly um, lists the species that are, that are endemic, the species and the subspecies. So very good, very good book if, you are, if you're thinking of heading over there. So this is my final slide, just looking out towards the Blue Mountains uh, from the grounds of the lodge. Um, and yeah, I, I hope you can visit. It's a, a fantastic tour, very relaxed. Um, and uh, um, and uh, yeah, you can see all the, you know, all the endemic species and more um, on a visit there. So if you have any other questions, I'll be, be delighted to help. Um, but that's, uh, that just about wraps it up for me. Thanks again for listening. I'll pass you back over to, uh, to Sarah. Thank you so much, Tom. A fantastic talk. And thank you very much, Andy and Maritza as well. And thank you all for your comments that you've been uh, sending in, most of them coming to us directly, but thanking us for the great presentation evening. I've now got four more tours added to my list. Uh, well, thank you. That's uh, it's great to know. Uh, do keep your questions coming in. I uh, will now go to some of the questions that we've been asked during the talks, but if you're thinking of some now or if you've been saving them up, please do start firing them to us uh, using the Q&A section and we will start going through them. Uh, so first one here, uh, Stephen Fowles says, there's been little mention of mammals this evening. Are there any monkeys on any of the islands visited today? Sadly not. In the case of Cuba, and as far as I know, not uh, across the Caribbean, sadly not. They didn't make it. I go for all of these islands. Yeah, no, no endemic mammals on uh, Puerto Rico, Cuba, or in fact any of the Caribbean islands. Join us in South America for your New World Mammal Fix. Yeah, the, the only mammal in, on Jamaica is an introduced Indian mongoose. So that's, that, that's the, the mammal list done there. So yeah, not a mammal destination. No. I think for St. Lucia, it's um, it's good. It's the bats. So we do we do obviously visit to see the bat cave, and in the evening times we see bats flying past our rooms. Um, and like Tom just said, we do see some of the introduced mongooses and things like that. But um, but generally, it's it's the birds, it's the reptiles, and the and the insects really to to enjoy. Thanks all. Uh, Ed, I'll put this question to you. And uh, this is from Nicola James. She says, I can see there is a tour that does Trinidad only without Tobago. Are there any gems that would be missed if only visiting Trinidad? I appreciate it comes down to preference. Thank you. Yeah, so we do um, we do, do our Trinidad Go Slow Tour, which basically is, is kind of going to these different places I talked about, but at a slightly slower pace. Um, on Tobago, really, you've got the white-tailed sable wing, the hummingbird that I mentioned, uh, the yellow-legged thrush, some of the seabirds, like the red-billed tropic bird. Um, but actually, the majority of, of the wildlife on Trinidad, you, you, you would definitely see there. So, so Tobago offers a sort of lovely kind of beach, the chance to go to an island and, and, see, and see several more species. What I would say about Tobago, though, is that some of the species that sometimes you struggle to see in Trinidad, you can sometimes see a little bit easier in Tobago. I think just they've got slightly sort of smaller forest area. They get perhaps a little bit more used to seeing people. But on the whole, to answer your question, no, you will see 
Um, I'm just trying to think now. So when I was there last in Trinidad, I saw 239 bird species. So you will get the majority of those birds and the reptiles um, and and the, the butterflies, etc., on Trinidad itself. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Tom, a question for you from Simon Young. He says, Jamaica, November or February? <clears throat> and we've historically you've been for the last sort of seven or eight years we've been running it running the tour in, in February um just just this year we put on a put on a departure in November um but yeah either month um is yeah that's sort of into the you know the drier time and a, is a you know preferable time to visit so either really um there's no no sort of better month for seeing the, the endemic species thanks Tom Andy is an American visa needed to visit Puerto Rico it is, yeah, American visas are called Estes. You apply for them online. It's a quick and easy process. I think that costs about $14 and you get them back almost instant instantaneously. Once you've got one, it's valid for two years. Thank you. A question from Richard Mayat. Do the guides have tripods, digiscopes, et cetera, for use uh, with the clients or do we have to squeeze them into our hand luggage? Uh, Ed, I'll put that to you. So with regards to our uh, kit, so, so most of us guides will take um, a scope and a tripod with, with us if we've, if we've got them available. So usually, for example, with St Lucia or any of the tours I do, I'd have my scope and tripod. And then when we're at a viewpoint or an open landscape or a wetland, for example, then those people who, who don't have, have that kit would, would be invited to be able to share and uh, have a look at these wildlife a little bit closer. So yes, on the whole, we would be taking a tripod and a, and a, and a telescope, for example, with us. Great, thank you. And another one for you, Ed, are there opportunities to snorkel in St Lucia? Yes, absolutely. Every day, basically. Um, so in St Lucia, we've generally got an excursion or an activity in the morning, um, but in the afternoon, usually early to mid-afternoon onwards, we've always got the afternoon for you to have time out for yourself. So there is always a chance to snorkel. And at St Lucia and Chastanet, we've got Scuba, which is the hotel's own kind of underwater centre. And you don't have to hire the kit at any fee. It's all included in, in being part of the hotel. So you can actually get your fins and your face mask, etc., actually from the hotel and go snorkeling every day if you wish. Great, thank you. I'll put this to all panellists because we've had several questions on this this evening. Some of you have mentioned it in your talks, but we're still getting questions on it. Um, can you uh, explain whether the hotels and accommodation have got decent vegetarian options? Yeah, I always start with that if, if uh, um, you'll let me. Um, as I think Ed was, was crystal and, and very, very specific about the diet of the Caribbean, all the food and very uh, varied food. Um, and uh, it is the case that it, it can it, it can please any any diets any diets vegetarian pescatarians um, carnivores omnivorous um, it's a well varied um, and and fresh um, uh, food uh, produced down there in the case of Cuba because it's Cuba is a special case because uh, they cook whatever they can get on the day or that week. Um, uh, despite of that, it's it's um, still pretty good, and the hotels always adjust, trying to make a huge effort to adjust to uh, many many tummies, many many diets down there. Um, but we have to say that uh, uh, in most of the hotels we go, uh, where we visit, are they're all inclusive. So there's a plentiful of food, salads, uh, different rices, uh, different um, um, uh, cheeses, and things. So it's it's well varied. It's well varied. Thank you, Byron. A question just in from Tony Sinnott. Which is the most laid back trip and best for a non-birding partner? <laughs> well, St. Lucia was definitely designed for that very reason. So I mentioned in my talk earlier that actually it was designed for the very reason that if you've got a partner who's less into birds, then actually the St. Lucia tour is ideal because we go out in the morning, uh, you know, you don't have to, but we've got the dolphins, for example, we've got the forests, but you've always got early to mid afternoon to actually or onwards to then actually relax around the hotel and the beach and what have you. And so when I've done this over the last 10 years or so, quite often partners who are less interested in, in going out bird watching have either decided to stay the whole day uh, at the hotel or come out on some of those excursions that kind of finish around about 12 o'clock, one o'clock or so. 
Uh, with regards to Cuba, if I can add, if I can add, um, uh, can join uh, Ed's uh, um, answer. Um, uh, Cuba, Cuba is rich in history, and to, we we try to confine that along or or wildlife tour. Uh, um, and and the big asset of our tour is we have a national guide, a well experienced national guide that will uh, tell us every day about all the history aspects of the of the city, as well as we're going to be uh, involved in in the whole the whole. Um, uh, visiting museums, visiting everything related to the revolution and whatever the the, the Cuban history uh, entails, and that can be a very good um, excuse for for the non birding to um, step apart and enjoy the, the trip. As well, we have fantastic uh, beaches, as you saw, with with with, with um, uh, great opportunities of uh, relaxation, you know, sunbathing, and also snorkeling uh, around the cenotes in in especially in the southern uh, coast of uh, Cuba. Great, thanks both. Uh, a question from uh, Sarah Blades. Uh, Ed, is there a chance to visit Trinidad after the main trip? Yes, so with, with all nature track trips, or certainly all the ones I've done, we there's always the opportunity to either go there beforehand or have an extension afterwards. So absolutely with Trinidad, we can help you out with that. Um, so if you would like to stay on for an extra few days, whether it's at Ace or Wright or a different hotel, then we can, we can help make that happen for you, absolutely. Thanks, Ed. And Andy, this one's for you from Martin Searle. Um, Andy mentioned uh, interest in combining tourism, and we would be interested, e.g. Cuba and Puerto Rico. The dates overlap in the brochure, which suggests that may be feasible, but this is something that we're possibly going to try and look at, isn't it, Andy? Absolutely. I mentioned this in my talk earlier, and I was talking to Tom. We were on the phone, Tom, this afternoon about this. At Nature Trek, each operation manager deals with a different selection of tools, and sometimes we're working in parallel without actually cross-referencing with each other. So we've got this rather silly situation of my tour to Cuba and, uh, and Tom's tour to Jamaica and Trinidad and my tour to Puerto Rico, and often the dates are overlapping, whereas actually there's a great opportunity there to work a bit more closely together and have one tour leading straight on after the other. Because to these Caribbean islands, seven hundred pounds of your holiday spend goes on the international airfare. So in many ways, it makes sense to invest that airfare in a longer holiday if you've got the time and the budget. So we will actively be looking to combine some of these Caribbean islands. Uh, so if you choose, you can merge them and create a longer holiday. So watch this space on that one. That's great. Thanks, Andy. Um, Byron, a question for you from Stephen Griffin: How long is the Cuba trip, and do we run several each year? Um, our, our trip is nearly a fortnight. It's 13 days uh, combining the day in and the day out, the inbound and outbound. Um, and uh, during during that time, we visit the best the best uh, hotspots uh, for wildlife in Cuba. Um, why January? Well, sorry, why uh, November and, and, and March? We do two departures, November and March. Both of them are um, great in terms of see all the all the wildlife and the endemics. Uh, and having also the the, um, the um, advantage of um, seeing uh, the North American warblers and, and all the North American migratory birds that actually winter in, in Cuba during those months. Great, thanks Byron. Uh, just a message from Loz Hayward here. I'm, she says, I'm more of a big cat person, but tonight's presentations have been excellent. Thanks very much, Loz. Do we have any more questions to come in? Um, if you do have one, please fire them to us now. If any of the panelists have got anything else that they would like to say, um, please do feel free to, to add it. Otherwise, we can wrap the evening up. And I think I'd like to say a huge thank you to, to all of our presenters for joining us tonight. Um, Andy, thank you to Maritza for joining as well. Um, and thank you all so much for listening at home. This is the 11th presentation evening we've, we've done so far, but if you have missed any of them, then don't worry. Uh, they are available to watch online via our website. If you hop onto our homepage, you'll be able to find a link to them there, which you can watch at your leisure. If you'd like to give us any feedback on this evening, then that's very welcome. Please do send it in to us. Likewise, if you think of any questions, uh, tomorrow or after the presentations, please do email them into us as well. You can get us at info at naturetrek.co.uk. 
Finally, if you're a member of a natural history club or society and you'd like a nature trick speaker to deliver an online presentation to your members free of charge, then we're very happy to do that and arrange it for you. Please just contact us to let us know what you'd be interested in. We'll be back at the same time on Wednesday evening at 7.30, where we'll be taking you to North America, covering Western Canada, Arizona, Texas, Florida, and Yellowstone. So we hope you can join us. We'll stay online for the next five minutes or so, just in case you've got any last minute questions. But until the next time, take care and good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot, folks. Right. Thank you very much. Bye.